Hi and welcome. I'm Dolly Merchandani, a partner in Whiting Cases New York office and the leader of our global infrastructure, transportation and logistics industry group. Lee, welcome and thank you for joining us for our Leader in Water uh, interview series. Um, let's start by you telling us about your professional background in the water and wastewater sectors. Where do you currently work? What's your role in Remit? Thank you, Dolly, um, and thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Lee Torstein. I'm CEO of IDE Water Assets, which is the um, development, asset management, and concession arm of IDE. It is a pleasure to be here and, and talk about water. Uh, and like any other water geek, uh, I can talk about water for hours. Um, I've been uh, in the infrastructure world for about two decades now with uh, the greater part of it around water and wastewater. We work on development and management of assets, of water assets, um, across the globe. Well, you know, just to do a deep dive into the water sector, because you spent more than two decades working on it, um, what do you view as the key opportunities, but also the most pressing challenges for companies in the water and wastewater sector like IDE? Uh, water has always been a necessity across the world. Uh, we do see a shift in the places where water is becoming more and more challenging and where there's uh, greater scarcity these days that we have not seen before. Those definitely raise an opportunity, but are challenging as well. Um, if I look at uh, the U.S. market, for example, then the southwest of the U.S. has become more and more challenged with water, whereas other parts of, of, the, of the country are challenged by other um, issues that have not been here before, such as the forever chemicals and emerging contaminants that we're talking about today. So those uh, as well create a, uh, an opportunity. And if we're looking at the PFAS, PFOs, what started here in the U.S., we have seen the European legislation and then other places across the world catching up in terms of limitations on what could be in the feed water. That's a whole new world that has not been here before. Uh, challenges, on the other hand, are uh, water has been, in many places, for too long, too cheap. Uh, the price for water, in many places, is not actually reflecting its value. And for uh, treatment of water, and to be, to be able to actually treat well, there's a cost attached to it. Mm -hmm. And that is probably one of the biggest challenges, is how do you, on the one hand, provide the good quality of water that you want and the reliable source of water, but on the other hand, make sure that it is affordable or within prices that our um, residents are willing to pay. Requires a lot of work on both ends, the private sector and the public sector as well. Thank you. So you know, given the need for collaboration between the private and the public sector, what policies or regulations do you think are essential for effective water management and how can they be improved, especially here in the U.S.? Yeah. Um, so uh, the policies and the regulations are, are critical. Um, if I go back to discussions on, on price of water, so as I said, water has been, especially here in the U.S., um, at, at a low cost for many, many years. Um, that has to change. So the realization that in order to get a reliable, clean, uh, well-treated uh, water supply, there's a cost attached to it. Part of it would be the education and uh, um, the changes of tariffs. That would be education of the public sector as well as the residents and the people. Uh, the changes are not as dramatic at the end of the day, but they are uh, existing. So it is part of those uh, uh, that understanding. In addition to that, um, there is far more places where the state and federal can in intervene in order to make sure that some of these water issues and water crises are solved. We hardly ever see that somebody would take upon himself to have treated water or additional treatments that are not required by regulation just for the sake of environment or health regulations because, again, it has a cost attached to it. So that would be part of it. The other part would be um, in making sure that there is a um, cost effectiveness, effectiveness for the project. And that would mean that here, if we're looking in the U.S., it is a very local market for water. Mm -hmm. If the regulations enable, and that would be on the commercial side, not necessarily the technical, uh, technical side, if the regulations enable swap of water rights, if they enable collaboration between different areas, different regions on a water facility, for example, with distribution, that would help 
have uh, bigger facilities, which would then reduce the price and provide more water for more people. Also with that, um, the regulations around permitting for discharge and others um, would currently take a little bit too long. So with a life cycle of, you know, between two to three to five years for a discharge permit, that takes the whole project and the existence or the viability of a project to a much longer place than we would want to be. So I think that's where state and federal can also help on regulations, is making sure requirements, um, permits, are being managed in a more favorable manner in a shorter time frame. Yeah, I think it's a really acute point you're making about um, the need for aggregation and economies of scale uh, with such a disaggregated uh, water landscape in the U.S. and fragmentation of the market. Um, you do wonder about individual systems' uh, abilities to upgrade and get to you know, levels of compliance with the new regulations that are coming out on quality and having a regulatory framework that might actually encourage aggregation of systems could help you know, drive some of those uh, improvements. I, I agree. Um, let's move on to um, another related uh, topic, which some people are saying that the emerging water crisis has parallels to the energy transition. And to what extent do you envisage what people are now calling a global water transition? And how do you think this will impact stakeholders who are working in the water and wastewater sectors? Um, I think that there are some resemblance between what we've seen on the um, energy and energy transition uh, and what we are seeing with water. But sometimes that resemblance is what confuses people because there's a thought that it is and it works the same way and there's very you know there's mm -hmm. very big differences between the two. Uh, I do see that if we look at water and part of that transition that I would want to see um, is a, a little bit of a kind of overview of what of water and water supply and water management. So that would be, if we're looking into the transition of energy into renewables and part of that transition or most of the transition was led by incentives. So part of those incentives need to also um, happen on the water, uh, in the water business and the water field in order to make sure that this would be more widespread as we've seen with the, with the energy. Um, there are initiatives that are being discussed today as water positive, as we call it, mm -hmm. is that you make sure that the water that you consume from the environment would be the same amount of water that you actually return to the environment. Mm -hmm. So by having these cross-reference between, for example, industrials that consume water and then other projects, infrastructure that creates water, mm -hmm. and combining the two under the same umbrella, the same um, commercial fiscal incentives, then we could see part of that transition as into moving to something that is a little bit more um, oriented towards kind of the, the credit, as we call it. Uh, I think that could make a difference. That requires um, a lot of work on the leadership side, again, uh, policies and regulations, mm -hmm. uh, but it definitely can happen. On the water technologies itself, there's, uh, I think, a little bit of a different type of, of change that we could see. Well, let's um, let's move and talk to talk to that next uh, technology. So, you know, like all utilities, we're expecting water to be heavily impacted by advances in AI and and technology, and you know they will hopefully bring you know improved water treatment, accessibility, transmission solutions. But there's also going to be an increase in related risks, for example, cybersecurity. So, do you have any views on how? we can optimize the deployment of technology while managing the risks of technology, um, you know, including safety and reliability? Uh, that is a very good question. And I think if we look at the water technologies and water treatment that we've seen around, then the changes have not, that, have not been that um, significant. Um, not to say that there's no uh, technological innovation and, and, and development. There's all of the time and it's constant. But in the water treatment uh, uh, world, we've seen a number of different changes ar across the world. But if you look at the membrane-based uh, type of facilities that have been around for a, a few decades, the changes and the shifts between those are not as um, as significant, I would say, um, that to the technology. It's more the, the uh, 
how do we implement those and the kind of surroundings to that is how much you know how much energy do we consume how much chemicals do we consume what is the cost of building it etc um, AI is something that has been very interestingly looked at in the water business mm -hmm. how can we implement AI into the world of water treatment water management water unlike as we said, like an, unlike energy, is a very is a living organism. It changes all the time. Mm -hmm. Can we really sub rely on AI for um, uh, for our water maintenance and water operations? For example, uh, it's a question that we always ask. Uh, as human beings, we have a tendency to believe that nothing can replace our knowledge, right, and and experience. Um, I'm not sure I share that um, perspective. I think that. Uh, we need to give it a lot more thought as how can that uh, prevent some of the maybe, you know, human errors that we have uh, on the one hand, but also be able to um, include all of those expertise that person can have after so many years in the business. Um, so that is, do we actually, or how can we implement AI in our systems? There are other technological advantages that we could use um, that could make our water treatment more efficient mm -hmm. um, and control and looking at, we've been looking in uh, in several places or project down in, in Chile a number of years ago for which was a remote project to have it almost uh, fully automated uh, operations. That mm -hmm. would be having the operating room, you know, 200 miles from, from the site. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a good question of how can we do this? It, it's, there's less labor around the, the remote area and can we actually have everything done remotely. Uh, it, it was a big discussion around it. Um, part of it was, can we rely on the systems? What happens if, you know, something would break down? What happens if there's a cyber issue? Uh, it can definitely help us if we're looking, you know, if you want to look at remote, if we're looking at smaller um, installations that are going to be operated by a single um, centralized uh, control room, for example then we're gonna to need to rely a lot more on technologies. How do we protect it? Um, I believe that as the water technologies and, and those evolve, mm -hmm. the cyber issues and cybersecurity evolves probably even faster. And I trust that there is enough work around the cybersecurity um, issues that we could be protected even with our, with our water facilities. Uh, to, extent, to an extent that if we are not, then there's so many other places uh, in our lives that would be uh, jeopardized that I'm not sure that the water would be the biggest issue. Um, so I would trust mm -hmm. the ability f to protect it and I would uh, definitely put a lot of emphasis and thought at how could we use that technology um, to our advantage, which is something that is not done enough on the water on the water's, um, arena today. You know, I, I, I think it's really interesting what you're saying because it sounds to me as if there's already a lot of technology that is deployed. And certainly in the projects that we've worked with you on, you know, we've seen how, how those challenges of cyber and other issues are, are navigated adroitly. That said, um, it may be that um, public authorities that are struggling with modernization and, you know, not optimizing systems and are perhaps engaging in excess expenditure as a result might see the, you know, the, the utilization and optimization of technology as something that the private sector can actually help them with, that they, you know, are less adept at doing themselves. So I wonder if that might also uh, promote uh, you know, collaboration between mm -hmm. the private and public sectors and present an opportunity for you, given given the relative sophistication yeah. of, you know, certainly the systems that I know that you mm -hmm. have implemented on a, on a process side. Yeah, I think I, I think that's right, because as water is, is local, if we're looking um, here in the U.S. and, and other communities, it is uh, more challenging for a local community to be able to even be exposed to the different opportunities of, of securing their infrastructure, right. uh, whereas a company that has the experience and has done this, you know, working globally with different states and different places around the world, and, and so far has also have these very close relationships with the cybersecurity companies mm -hmm. that are um, providing this umbrella to all of, for example, for all of our facilities. Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely leverage for the private sector to come in with the solutions for this, as this is something that, that they're doing um, on a daily basis elsewhere. Um, that is definitely an, an add-on, I would say, for involving the private sector in, in some of these public uh, 
um, required infrastructure. That's great. So, I mean, just shifting gears, um, it's a universally shared resource, of course, and water is uh, an almost uniquely national and also international issue. Um, obviously acutely affected by national interests, regulatory frameworks, but also international politics and trends. So if you were to gaze into your crystal ball, how do you anticipate the water and wastewater industry evolving over the next 10 years, let's say? Um, I think that's a question that everybody asks themselves or every uh, leader in an industry is, you know, where do we want to go? Where are we heading when we look uh, into the future? Um, there's probably a number of different um, perspectives to this to this question. Um, you know, if you'd ask me where do I want us to be 10 years from now, it's probably where not where the world is going to be. Um, and the water and wastewater cycles are very long. So while it may not be fully op you know, operational in 10 years, um, but definitely if we look, you know, 20, 30 mm -hmm. years from now, I don't believe water scarcity is going to go away. I think that everybody understands that it's, you know, it's something that's here to stay. Even if we have a rainy day, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's uh, a change in our environment. And we need to be um, able not only to try to mitigate that, but to adapt to where we are and provide for new sources of water. I think that now we're seeing these changes in the realization of, of the leaders of, of these communities. Um, and this life cycle of the time it takes to actually implement a water project will be at a place that 10 years from now, we'll see a tremendous shift in, in relying on external sources of water versus surface water. So that would be, uh, if we're looking at desalination, for example, um, maybe also a brackish groundwater in places where there's no um, seawater. But also attached to that would be uh, the understanding that every drop matters. Mm -hmm. That is, we're not going to see water that is not being reused, for example. Uh, I would imagine that in most places around the world we'll see, we'll try to reach those levels of recycle of the water that will reach the around, you know, 90 percent, and which mm -hmm. makes sense. Water that could be used for industrial, landscape, agriculture, and of course, up to potable water. And even if we use that water for replenishment of aquifers, mm -hmm. that is creation of additional water and sources for our future. Um, so uh, 10 years from now, I, I believe we'll be seeing a lot more uh, recycling of the water, um, definitely more creation of new sources. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about PFAS and PFOS for just a bit. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that has, you know, that is new to the world. It's mm -hmm. been around and it's been under discussion mostly for the last, I'd say, year or so, maybe a little bit more. But the understanding is that we're going to need to have some work on our water, some treatment, some levels of additional treatment. We're not just going to be able to pump the water and, and send it out to the, to the residents. Mm -hmm. um, water rates are going to go up across the globe. Um, it's an understanding that you have to pay for water, which I think that today, as I said, many people uh, do not believe that. Um, there's a big discussion, you know, if it's a, if it's our human right to have water, is it, do we still need to ha um, have it for free or not? Uh, and you can say you can get it from free if you can dig a well and, and you know, pump up your own water, but even just digging a well and pumping up water has a cost. So that cost associated with treatment of the water, that is what you need to pay for. You don't pay for the water mm -hmm. itself, it's the treatment that you pay for. So I think, again, 10 years from now, we'll see a shift in people's mind as to why do we, why do we need to pay for water, and that in itself will create more and more um, water treatment projects. Um, what I also see now, and I think that is probably going to be um, the end game 10 years from now, is water treatment today is not becoming only just about the water. It's becoming, it's a whole package of, of what we have around it. It's the water, um, it's the energy consumption, it's the, cre it's the you know, carbon emissions and or carbon capture that we are able to have within the facility itself with adjacent infrastructure. Um, it's going to be looked as a more and more as a commercial um, game of how do we actually structure our projects to make sure 
that we are not only providing you water, but we have all these other benefits and add-ons to our offering that make the water more affordable, hence, but we're also saving or protecting the environment in addition. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to shift from just zooming in on water mm -hmm. and, and look at this a little bit more as a broad overall solution that we're providing. Thank you, Lee. Uh, you've really given us a, a lot to think about, um, a lot of complexity, a lot of challenges, but also a wealth of opportunity for those people who want to dig in and solve problems, as I know you and your team do every day. So thank you for joining us. And um, we will stay tuned to see how IDE's um, uh, projects evolve in light of all of these uh, market opportunities. Thank you for having me. And um, let's have water. <laughs> thank you.